everybody. Welcome in for another episode of Volco Confidential. I'm your host, Austin Price, brought to you by Knoxville Smiles. They do great, fantastic dentistry. Check them out at KnoxvilleSmiles.com. Tennessee coming off a big win over Chattanooga to kick off the season. We hope everybody enjoyed Darrell Sims last week, Alec Ablin on tonight's show. But before him, we bring in Will Crockett. Will, you head to Charlotte now, NC State, big game coming up this weekend. Where can Tennessee fans find the volunteer club over in Charlotte? Yeah, so we're going to be in Charlotte. We're still working on some details for Friday night, but right now we're going to be uh, in town uh, on Saturday. We will get those details out to you uh, so ball club members can meet up. We're going to have a spot for you to where if you're not real sure where to go in Charlotte, we're going to have that uh, just squared away for you. Come find us, hang out with ball fans before going into the game and, and getting a big win. What's the biggest changes you've seen in, 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 in NIL over the last several months as far as, I mean, it seems like it's in an ever-evolving world. Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of rules and laws that kind of keep getting brought up, but nobody really knows what they mean exactly yet. So we're still just trying to always adjust to what's in front of us. Uh, we do our best to stay ahead of it, but sometimes you just don't know what's there. So we're always trying to find ways to make sure that we're staying in front. And you know, I think that's been important for us since all of this started. When you look at Tennessee as an athletic department, as a state, we're leaders in what we do. So we always want to continue to just maintain that. Now for more on Knoxville Smiles. Knoxville Smiles, depending on us to make your smile better. Knoxville Smiles, are you happy with your smile today? Knoxville Smiles, we're all about smiles. Hey Lance, what makes you smile? Uh, pancake blocks. <laughs> <laughs> You're in year two as an on-the-field coach. I know it's probably more accelerated than you thought you would have at this point. What have you learned from year one to year two? Yeah, I think just be yourself. Like, honestly, there's going to be things that are new to you and things that you learn on the way. But at the end of the day, you got to be you. You can't be anybody else. And um, don't be afraid to change. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to um, do things a little bit different than what's been done before. Does it help that you know you're you you've known Coach Heupel, Coach Halsley, Coach Ellerby, uh, yeah, you know, who's a mentor to you? Like as as you kind of journey through this early part of your career, that they're always there, you know, guys that you know like the back of your hand. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you need somebody to lean on, or when there's something that would normally be a difficult conversation, it's really not with those guys. And uh, when you've got trust built up over a bunch of years, and um, you know, you work for a guy that is open-minded and a guy that is constantly trying to be the best you can be. You know, if you bring an idea or bring a thought, it's met usually with a lot of deep thought, but also an open mind. Um, that part of it's really cool. I don't think I've ever talked to you about this. When, when, when Josh came to you and told you he wanted to elevate you to an on-the-field assistant, what was that conversation like? What was your mind like? in that conversation pretty excited uh to be honest with you i mean it was uh it was a long process from the time that coach Golish left to the time that i got promoted and um you know it wasn't just a promotion because hey you're the next guy that's here he went through and interviewed a lot of people and talked to a lot of people and that process took i mean six weeks maybe it was a while it, yeah. it took a long time Coach there's no hiring fast well, <laughs> no, you know like, he's, no matter who it is he's going to be thorough and he's going to be detailed and he's going to make sure it's the best thing for the program and uh you know obviously i was excited and ready to get to work and had a chip on my shoulder and ready to go prove it and uh, but really just grateful for the opportunity was that in his office like yeah it was in his office um you know he we'd been pulled in there a couple of times for you know, why do you want this job and things like that. And uh, he came in and contract was there and said, go through it, take as much time as you need to kind of make sure everything's okay and looks right. And um, there were some other things said afterwards that I won't, we'll keep between us, but it was pretty cool. So it was that simple. Like he just you know, brought yeah. you in and just put the contract in front of you. Yeah. Josh is a big kind of practical joker. I could see him being like, I'm going to go in another direction. Nah, I'm just playing. You know, like, that, yeah, that, I don't that, know. I'm actually surprised that didn't happen. 
low key he kind of has some of that in him. I don't think with that he would do that, but um, <laughs> he does like the practical jokes. He does, and he there's a lot of times, especially when people first meet him, I don't think they can tell if he's serious or if he's joking. And you know, there's times where he is dead serious, and you might think something's funny and it's not. And <laughs> there's other times where <laughs> you think he's serious and he's just messing around. But the more you get around him, the more you've been with him, the more you can tell kind of where he's coming from who's the best at getting over something like that on staff how do you mean getting over it getting over a uh, like a practical joke like getting somebody to believe one thing and then pulling the rug ah uh, i mean i think everybody handles it pretty well i think there's uh coach Ellaby's probably the one you stay away with um trying to get him on stuff but as far as like everyday practical jokes there's not a whole lot of that no no what i was meaning like who like, who's the best practical joker on the staff? Hmm. Who, who can pull that off? Probably hype. Probably. I, there's not a whole lot of that. I think a lot of the time when we're in the office, things are, you know, pretty straightforward, pretty direct. There's not a whole lot of um, joking about some of that stuff. I don't know. I think hype probably more than anybody else. What's the biggest thing you learned from Glenn? Man, he's uh, – get your guys to play really hard um, love and trust is something that when you start building a room and I, when I think about when he got to Missouri in 16 um, you know we had a big meeting and what his family mean to everybody and this was whole team and guys were saying oh accountability and you know uh, we got to be disciplined and like looking for coach answers and we came back to the line room and he's like we just talked about family for 10 minutes and nobody said love like it's got to start there understanding that there's a difference in how people display love um, but kind of know that that's where his heart was coming from and that everything he was asking us to do was coming from that place um, as rough around the edges as it may have been at that time but it's something that um, you know he's himself every day he's the most thorough guy the most attention to detail oriented guy I've been around um, trying to take as much of that from him as possible and still be myself as I do it too. You're an old, old lineman, but you played a little tight end there in college. Yeah. So when you when you moved the to tight end, coach tight ends, did you feel like it was a little easier for you because you'd at least played it for a little bit of a stretch? Yeah, absolutely. I think the way that we operate, you know, there's no huddle. Um, the signals at most offenses give an entire signal, a formation, everything like that, and the way that we operate there's a lot of implied things for the tight end where you've got to understand kind of the big picture and where you fit within it. Um, going back to being 22 years old, seeing signals lining up for walkthroughs, lining up in games, understanding what that looks like when the play ends, your eyes have got to come back, you got to find the signal, and you're not getting told where to line up. You're understanding the play, and you're lining up based off what you got to do. Um, I think that part of it really helped. Um, you know, in the run game, obviously I wasn't running a lot of downfield routes in my role as sure. a tight end. Uh, but there's certain blocks off the uh, off the ball, whether it's counters or inserts, where you know people have taught it one way for a long time, or people have this is the coach textbook way that you teach this block. And as a player, there were certain things I was like, man, that's a little bit. I don't know if that's real. <laughs> like having actually tried to do this block, man, this is what made sense to me. This is probably the way that it actually works best for what we do and a lot of those conversations year one and a lot of shoot my interview was here's what we're saying here's what's been said for the last 10 years here's something I believe about this position that I believe in and want to try and see um, so I think playing it helped not just from that the other thing is I mean there's parts of this job that aren't super fun you know you get um, you cut out a C gap or you got to go ISO on a really big backer from somewhere and when you've done that yourself, it's easier to ask the guys to do that as well. Do you have footage? There's Practice video out there somewhere of you playing tight end. I've get, there's some game clips. Um, do you ever pull now, this out? I do have practice footage of me catching some passes in practice. And I think uh, Coach Heupel's last day, <laughs> uh, we were in bull prep, and uh, I'm not sure if he'd taken the UCF job or not. Um, but the way he called the you know, twos that day made me think, okay, maybe he knew because there was a pop pass to me. There was a uh, quick ball to the flat to me. I got my number called like four times on 
one of my last drives uh, on Coach Hype's last day at Missouri and thought, you know, looking back, like, I wonder if he knew then because he was feeding me a lot that day and normally – Was this in practice? Yeah, this was in bull prep with, like, the twos and threes yeah. running drives, yeah. So I – Have you ever pulled it out? I, yeah, I've got video on my phone. You, are you wanting to watch? No, I'm just thinking from a standpoint <laughs> of, like, do you ever pull this out? Like, hey, look, look, Holden, I did it. You know, the, the one day um, – our short yardage package, I was one of the fullbacks on that. And um, whenever we're installing it with the whoever's serving that role, we'll have the cut up and go through what the fundamentals of it are and then show them, hey, listen, if I can do this, you can do this, and pull it out and show them what it's supposed to look like. But it's, uh, I don't know, glory days, I guess. <laughs> Best memory of playing at Missouri was what? Mm, there's really two. I think year one. We beat Texas A&M, Johnny Menzel uh, to clinch the SC East. And, uh, you know, fans stormed the field. It was a pretty cool moment knowing that um, we'd won the East and we're going to play in Atlanta and beating a good Texas A&M team. That was probably, you know, the textbook first cool, cool moment. Sure. Um, you know, my red shirt sophomore year, I'd kind of been in and out of the starting lineup at guard and had kind of gotten beaten out during the middle of the year. By week hits, there's a race strike. There's a lot of stuff going on around Mizzou at the time, and Coach Pinkle comes in um, on Friday night to announce that he's retiring. And a lot of uncertainty, a lot of things that are kind of up in the air. I think you could see it on the staff's face as well that who knows what this thing's going to look like. And we played BYU at Arrowhead. Um, I'd actually been sick that week and weighed like 280 wasn't really slotted to play guard comes in um has a back spasm or something in the second quarter played the rest of the game and played probably my best game at mizzou to that point and uh the feeling in that locker room after everything building up to it was something that like looking around that room those guys that we were able to go do that was pretty cool um that's probably the best moment like in individual moment i asked you a question about you know, kind of how you'd grown and, and what you took out of some of the, you know, the, the, the figure as a recruiter in year one to the success in year two. And you kind of got emotional and we put that on Twitter. And, yeah. Or X. Um, and you had several of your former teammates respond. It seemed like you just like a guy that like really loved by all these guys you played with. What, what does that group of guys mean to you? Yeah. I mean, that's, it means everything. Um, you know, uh, he Schuler was about to talk to the team about rivalry history and asked if anybody had heard of uh, Jerry Colquitt, I think was his name. Yeah. And that, that was his favorite ball of all time outside the Navy. And story about a guy that, you know, had been the starter, had helped him as a young quarterback, ended up getting beat out for the job, but was a guy that completely selfless, completely team first. Um, and – that's who I wanted to be as a player. And I realized, you know, somewhere in the middle of my career that I wasn't, you know, an elite SEC NFL guard center and understood that my role, okay, how can I become the best player I can be? How can I help this team? But also how can I be the best teammate? How can I bring young guys along? Um, and I think really started coaching without knowing I was coaching before I'd gotten done playing. Um, but I do think about it like it all goes back to love and trust. And if you've got that in your room, it can be really special and you'll have relationships that'll last a long time. What do you like about this year's group, this year's room? Man, they're fun to be around. Um, personality wise, they're, you know, very different, but also gel really well. I think last year was cool because you had Jay and Callie that were so mature, so grown up. Um, and we've got a mature group now, but there was definitely a, those guys were older and at kind of different phases of their life. Um, this group is way more all together, top to bottom. Um, but they come to work, they bring it, they want to be great, they work hard. Um, we have fun. It's just a good group to be around. What's the most? What? what give me a, an attribute of of each guy. Let's just start with. We'll start with, you know, Miles. What do you like about Miles? What, what's one attribute that stands out? Yeah, Miles loves football, man. He's tough. Um, he's going to give you everything you've got every single snap. Ethan. 
explosive, so fun. Um, I think I said it the other day, like when his personality, when his energy is the way it needs to be every day, um, he's just a light in our room. Holden. Intelligent, detailed. Um, like he is so focused all the time. Um, he really like is trying to be the best that he can be every single day and brings that out of the other guys as well. Cole Harrison. Goofy. But he's a goober. It, it is something where, you know, the way we play it is hard to pick up as a guy coming in in June. You know, most guys now get here in January and they've got all spring to kind of yeah. learn on the fly. I mean, he's taken a ton of reps um, just due to bodies and is operating at a really high level, but he's still a goober. And as he starts to settle in and starts to feel more comfortable, I'm excited to see what he's going to do. What makes you smile? Man, just being with the guys. Honestly, like I love being in that building every day. I love coaching football. I love being with Hayden here on the, the time we get off. I don't know. I'd, there's a lot of things that make me smile. Speaking of smiling, more from our great friends at Knoxville Smiles. I'm Tennessee basketball player J.P. Estrella. Let me give you a tour here of the offices at Knoxville Smiles. Dr. Costa is placing implants with a robot and it's all done digitally. There's no guessing with this since it's all robotic. Dr. Wilco is the newest addition to the office. He loves to research the latest and greatest in technology, so the other doctors go to him for the newest product information and techniques. Dr. Malone is building teeth in the mouth. To him, cosmetic bonding is more like artwork. He does this without cutting your teeth down. It's all about building them up. Guys, we still have a problem. Do y'all have a bigger chair? Keep sending those questions in. We love to get them from each fan on the Volunteer Club app. Send them in. This week's question comes from young Emily. Hi, Coach. My name is Emily. What's your favorite thing to do with your friends? Go Vols! Hi, Emily. I love playing golf and honestly just spending time with my buddies. We go to concerts a lot. Um, mainly golf, though. That's really what I like to do when I get some time off. Speaking of golf... What's you got to play the ocean course this summer uh, on, on your bachelor weekend? Um, you're getting married coming up in February. What's one golf course that you've not played that's not Augusta National because I think it's everybody's <laughs> bucket list that you want to play? You know, right now it's probably the honors. I just hear about it a lot just being in this area. I know it's an incredible golf course, and um, I've had my butt kicked by Pete Dye plenty and would look forward to another time out there. Everybody's had their butt kicked by Pete Dye. Um, what's your one club in your bag that you feel like is the most consistent? Not not many of them, honestly. Probably my 58 wedge. I feel pretty good with that right now. Putter on the 18th hole? Putter on the 18th hole is always going to be hot. <laughs> That's fantastic. You got the fiancé in the golf yet? Working on it. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe a Christmas gift coming down the road. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I don't know. My buddies and I have had this conversation of, well, do you want your wife to be a, a golf wife, or is that kind of your time away? And I don't know. We'll see if she likes it or not, but we'll we'll maybe explore that a little bit. Are you involved in the wedding planning at all, or is this kind of like you do you, and I'll just help with the honeymoon? She's absolutely crushed probably 95% of it. Um, I was in charge of the band, and I've got – pretty eclectic pretty deep cut music taste that i found were going to be tough to find in a wedding band so that kind of ended up being her call as well but so far everything's i mean i'm just showing up and saying i do <laughs> you haven't noticed she's over here um have you have you licked the stamps have you have you licked the envelopes yes. like, is, okay is, is all right i did contribute there yeah we we compiled addresses i was a key part of that um i did do some stamping and some envelope licking D did you just have one of those sponges where you dampen it and that no way just kinda... I, i'm weird i kind of like the taste of the envelope so i it's actually kind of my favorite part in the letter sending process oh this is like uh, will Leva <laughs> saying he likes to put mayonnaise in his coffee absolutely not <laughs> it's totally different austin you know that <laughs> where are we going on the honeymoon too do we That's know a good this question. Yet? I think she's going to end up planning that too. I don't know. Maybe somewhere warm. Europe, Europe next July, I think. Two-week Europe. Two Europe trip. Where in Europe, she'll probably be 
steering that, but I think Europe. <clears throat> Scotland, golf, Scotland. Golf. <laughs> That's your um, no shot. <laughs> Appreciate it though. There's golf everywhere, though, Abe's. Um, Josh Heupel, what's the biggest thing you've learned from him, from former coach to now boss? Yeah. Be who you are. Uh, be yourself. First and foremost, I do think that he doesn't try to be anybody but himself. He is incredibly detailed with everything he does, like looking at his practice face after practice. There's so many notes and so many things that he thinks about or things, questions he asks that, man, I would never have thought to ask that, and it's going to lead to something that helps us win a game in the fall. Um, more than that, though, I think from the time I was a player to a GA to a coach, like – Everybody in that building has a role. If you've got an idea that can make us better, you're hurting the team if you're not bringing that idea forward. And, and does that mean that every idea gets pushed forward and used? No, but he wants to have input from everybody, whether you're a student assistant or whether you've been doing this for 40 years. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why we've been able to kind of stay ahead of the curve so much because it's not just his ideas. He's able to get value from everybody and – everybody feel like they've got a role one place you've not been that you'd like to go europe scotland (laughs) i just put that in your head yeah are you a big animal experiences guy are you an outdoors guy like are you a hiker you know when we first got here um that first spring fridays during dead periods were always off and we'd go out to smokies and do a bunch of hikes and haven't done that as much recently, but I do love being out in the mountains down here. Um, growing up, loved to hunt, loved to fish. Duck season and football season. Do you like to get in the blind? I do. Country club hunting somewhere with a propane tank, and you go heat up some breakfast and wait for birds to show up. That's, That's why you got to go with the Mays family. They I know got their it. own blind we, out there been, in West Tennessee. We've been talking about it for a minute. The timing of season makes it really tough for me, but I would love to get out there with them. Trey goes out there, Trey Smith. Yep. You know. Yeah. Like six former offensive linemen in a blind. I just need a big blind. <laughs> you need a big blind. Would you get into like a shark cage? Is this Probably. Like- so fun fact, my mom, Julie Ablin's one of the most amazing people in the world. And uh, you know, after college she was kind of looking for what she was gonna do next and she'd taken a scuba diving class in college and uh Bought a one-way ticket to Grand Cayman and lived down there for two years as a dive instructor. So that's always something that I've looked like that would be really cool to do. I'm not scuba certified. My brother took the same class with the same teacher um, when he was at Mizzou as well. But it's uh, family-wise something I think would be really cool to do. See, I keep trying to, you know, we're going to go back to the Polynesian Bowl because Tennessee's got like so many guys in that game. And... I keep telling my wife I want to do this, uh, the manta rays at night, yeah. which means you go out in the ocean and they put that like a long kind of, it's almost a surfboard, it's like a long board and it has lights on it and it brings the plankton to the surface and then the manta rays come up and they swim around you and stuff, these big things that are as wide yeah. as my arms. Or I want to get in the shark cage and she keeps telling me, no, she's going to stay at the hotel that day if I do either one. Because <laughs> like we you did know, like, the- well, we've done well watching several times. We swam with sea turtles, like yeah. all that stuff's fun, but I, I want to see great whites, which I, that you're not really going to see that out there. But orcas, you're going to see that either. Yeah. Either, but like, I, I, there are certain things I want to. The manta rays would be cool. I'd sign I up agree. for that. Yeah, we should work on her and try to. It'd be cool. They're, are they relatively safe? Do you know? Yes, they have. Matt Ray just did them. He he was out there uh, back in July, and he and he's the one put me onto it. Yeah. And then, you know, your phone listens to you, so I, like, <laughs> I start talking rad. about it. And all these things coming up on my Instagram of, like, you know, these reels. I'm yeah. like. That'd uh, be cool. Are you a big reel guy? Do you watch reels? Uh, I'm addicted to TikTok, sadly. I've got to allow myself 15 minutes at the end of the night. I get my blue light <laughs> glasses on, and I'll scroll for 15 minutes. It drives her freaking crazy. But it's uh, kind of a way for me to shut off my brain and. Um, I love prank calls. I love the ones with prank calls. I can watch that stuff all day long. John Cena one. I love the John Cena one. That's a classic. It is. Trying to think. That woman loses her mind. (laughs) I've seen another one. I'm trying to think what it was. It's going to bug me until I think of it. But (laughs) the best ones with the ones like, "I'm sorry, ma'am. 
do you support the military? <laughs> She's like, oh, I'm so yeah. sorry. Yes, yes. And then she goes right into the music again. <laughs> That's so fantastic. All right. The new segment on the show. Last year we had Jordan LeBron. Jordan won. It was a narrow win. Mostly because we had a bunch of young kids in here who yeah. you know, have recency bias. Um, this year it is who's the one person that you can depend on to call. If I, if I ask you to call somebody, and again, the fiance's over here, so we're not calling her. Yeah, it's got to be dir- mom. It is mom again. It's got to be mom. All right, let's pull out the phone. Let's see if she answers. you got to put her on speakerphone. This could get interesting. Let's see. Like Dave Portnoy. One call, everybody knows the rules. <laughs> Then he takes like seven bites after he says one bite. Everybody knows the rules. Yeah, do you think I just tell her I'm on the vol? Alec, you okay? <laughs> I'm great. We're, we're here doing oh, an interview. Good. And they asked me uh, yes. if there is one person that I could count on to pick up the phone, who would it be? And it's you. So thank you for picking up. You're not calling mom oh, enough. Of course. Mom, he's not calling you enough if you're answering saying, are you okay? Okay, you need to be calling mom more. You know. One of those moms who, if he calls me at an off time, it worries me. I just have to make sure my baby's okay. And just to hear his voice makes me so happy. He, he was bragging on your scu- scuba diving skills. Oh, well, I like to go down under there. Yeah, it's a, pretty, it's a whole nother world underneath. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> I'll be good. <laughs> hey, enjoy your interview. You guys have a great time. All right, we'll do. Love you. All right, love you too, sweetheart. See you later. Bye-bye. That's fantastic. Mom's always coming in the clutch, and that's two weeks in a row. Darrell Sims' mom last week, Miss Avelyn this week, where the mom answers the phone, are you okay? <laughs> we, we talked probably two hours ago, so I'm not sure. We, I do a decent job. I, I really do. I know it's there's times where it becomes you know, a week or so, but she's, I mean, pretty awesome. So, No doubt. You, you got brother. Is he older or younger? He's younger. Yeah, I got a brother. He's, he's better than you in golf now. We've established he, he is. He is. Uh, there was about 22 years that couldn't beat me, and now it's like twice a year that I can get him. But Welcome to college coaching. It's it's sad. It really is. But he's an accountant back in St. Louis and one of my best friends. So it's, How often do uh, you talk to him? Uh, probably once, twice a week. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't know, usually he'll call me after a great round or I'll call him after a great round or he'll call me to ask if – such and such with recruiting that he just read and um you know he stays pretty involved and they'll be at a bunch of games this fall is he a member of all quest i don't think so this is disappointing yeah i know brother ablin you got one job my mom used to be on the power mizzou boards and i used to have to tell her like don't read that stuff you don't need it because i was not a very good player so there's a lot of negative stuff about me and it's like i don't want to know what people are saying about me please leave it off i loved you know last year when we established uh, the first year well, I was in recruiting, every time that like 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 when Riddell went to Georgia, people would post that picture of you at like three ten oh, in the Miz- on the Mizzou. In the Mizzou not picture. not my best picture. Looking back, the mustache is probably not the, the way to go. The mustache not the way to go. Yeah. And now, like you know, you got you know talking about how you're you're kicking butt in recruiting. So see, hey, same all, guy though. Honestly, all, correct. Exactly. Same guy. That's what I always tell them. Like they're quick to like praise me for being on top of it in a particular recruiting cycle, and I'm like, guys, I'm. The same guy last year that had three or four that I got technically wrong, even though yeah. I had them right. It's just the NIL era because it can flip on a dime yeah. um, with kids and their money now. So, like, it's just, you know, the same dude. You know, yeah. It all, it all, I hope that's still the bad signal for the good ones, right? Do they still post the mustache picture, or is it – are there other they pictures They do as in, in a in – a, uh, in a, in a, in a, in a, to, to rub it into the, all the negavols, as they call them. Negavols, that that okay. That you're crushing it. Awesome. I know, I do like that. That's a good pick. Yeah. So, it, real true story. Mustache that, was, was, a, was a bad choice. Well, it's kind of like the Will Ferrell on Anchorman when he's drinking the milk. Yeah. Like, milk, milk was a bad, a bad choice. choice. Well, I used to mess with really my mom on picture day and just try to make it look as bad as it could, and she'd get pissed because the program would have it in there. And wasn't thinking senior year that they actually, for senior night and for um, you know your, your last walk, they'd print out like a big poster thing. So it's that picture on like a four by six poster and it's hanging in my room. And uh, when you're using the bathroom, if you're washing your hands in the sink and that door is open, 
that picture is looking at you. Are you from. telling me your room at your parents' house is still preserved, kind of like Ray Finkel's was on Ace Ventura? Yeah, they haven't done anything with it yet, so it's still all the same. Laces out, Dan. Yeah. Laces <laughs> out. Have you ever seen the picture of the Tennessee fan who has, like, the power tee cut into his mustache, into his goatee? No, but I, like, I think I need to. I'd, it's I my buddy Chris Clapp. He's a uh, proud William Blunt uh, graduate, played basketball at Water State, and then – Decided like it. Honestly, I think you could actually. Yeah, I could probably do it. Yeah, just right here. When was the last time you were f- fully shaved? I really don't know. Probably, I'm sure there was something back in college that I had to be clean shaven for, but probably junior year of high school. Wow. Yeah, you weren't allowed to have facial hair till senior year. But been a while. That was a rule at the high school. Yep. So I. Catholic high school gotcha. seniors could have facial hair. Everybody else had to be clean shaven. They make you go shave in the dean's office if you had too much scruff going on. <laughs> what do you want to accomplish? Like, like, what's the next step for you? Yeah, um, one win a bunch of games this year, go win a championship, um, help some guys get drafted, and go pursue their professional goals. Uh, you know. If you asked me a year ago, I told you I probably wanted to coach O-line at some point, but the um, more I'm with this position, the more I've fallen in love with coaching tight ends where, um, I don't know, I'm pretty happy. I'd like to call plays at some point, but I think down the road I'll have a chance to do that. Does it easier to? Is it easier because you kind of like skip the go smaller to come back bigger? You kind of just went big right out of the gate. Yeah. Does, does it easier to be a little more patient with – you know, kind of like, you know, kind of the progression of things. Because you are young, so, I mean, yeah. like, there's no kind of, like, race to get to a certain point by a certain age. No, and I think, you know, you, you want to fight comfort and put yourself in a position to grow and continue to be the best coach you can be. But at the same time, um, I think we all realize as a staff how special this place is. Um, you don't want to break what's not – you don't fix what's not broke. Um, I love it at Tennessee. I really do. I love walking in that building every day. And um, – there's a a balance between pursuing what you want to achieve professionally and at the same time, you know, not messing up a great thing and being patient and understanding that if those things are meant to be, they'll happen on the right time and continue to just be present with where I am every day. Kelsey's a guy who just recently got married, has a little one, who has way better hair than anybody I know. Like that kid is crushing the He's hair a stud. He a stud. His mom rolls him in, on the, in, in the stroller and I'm like, Dude, I need some of your hair. Like, <laughs> I'm going bald. Me too. You do. Like, he needs it. Uh, he, uh, he he does not need it. He's got a fantastic head of hair. Um, but do, do you talk up to Kelsey, you know, like, hey, how do you balance this as a young married guy and now a young dad? Joey, a little more further yeah. down the line with kids. But, like, Glenn, even further down the line. But do you talk to them about from the outside, the, the off-the-field type of growth? Because, I mean, you're going to start experiencing, like, a, a new part of your life with getting yeah. married and then eventually having kids, that type of thing. No, for sure. I mean, it's it's cool to have people like that that you can look at and see how they're doing it as a dad and um, as a husband. And, you know, Kevin Pendleton's on staff. He's one of my best friends. And, you know, he's married. He's got two kids. And watching him be a dad after, you know, being away for four years at another stop, um, it's so cool. And also – you know, we've got plenty of time for that, but at the same time, like I am ready for that stage of life. I, I'm looking forward to it. Are you a big Disney guy? Theme park I, guy? I, I, I will be. You know, we used to take a Disney trip every few years or so, and, you know, living in Orlando, you go down to Disney every now and then, but I'm sure I'll grow to love it as much as you do, maybe. <laughs> Nobody loves it as much as I do. Uh, but that, that's the, you know, like the dad part of that, yeah. like coaching your kids. Like I know hype, uh, hype's favorite times are getting to go watch Jace or, yeah. you know, you know, his kids play. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's, well, there's different. So when I, you know, first got done playing, I knew that I'd like coaching college, but at the same time had seen what that work life balance can look like at places. And, um, was honestly going to go back to St. Louis get a finance job and maybe coach high school ball on the side and um, had a conversation with Barry Odom and he said listen you can go work a finance job and be an average dad you can go coach college football and be a great dad if you're with people that prioritize family 
you can make it work where you still have both. And he said, and maybe this is bad advice, but he said, when your kids are really little, it's really hard on your wife, but they won't remember much of it anyways. And he said, when, you know, your kids are in high school, they've got their own thing going and, you know, you're around and you're a part of their life, but they don't need you there every second of every day. And he said, the in-between, you get to be your hero. You give them permission to chase their dreams. Um, and that kind of convinced me, like, hey, let's give this thing a shot. And uh, two weeks into being a student assistant at Mizzou, I was like, dang it, this is what I'm supposed to do with my life. And, um, you know, I'm lucky to work for great people where family is prioritized and family is a part of the day-to-day in our building. And, um, you know, it's not 1982 anymore. You're not physically cutting up film. There's only certain so many hours you can watch so much tape that, you know, if you're at the office at 2 o'clock in 2024, what are you doing? Um, where, you know, 20 years ago, maybe that's not the case, but now there is a ability to have a little bit more work-life balance. And um, when you work for good people, that can still be a priority in your life. Well, man, we appreciate the time. Yeah. Good luck this fall. Good luck with the wedding in February. Appreciate it. And maybe, just maybe, if you're doing a two-week trip, she can <laughs> accompany you on one round of golf while you're over there in Europe. We'll, pack, you we'll pack the clubs just in case. The Golf National, where they just played the, uh, the Olympics in, in Paris. There we go. You want to go to Paris? She said no. We'll go. <laughs> Appreciate it, man. Thanks, Austin. Appreciate it, man. Be careful. Saturday.